Tenim la norma de sort de tenir al nostre costat un servidor públic, com molts de nosaltres. El senyor Stephenson és servidor públic, va treballar al Ministeri de Justícia a Londres i des de l'any 2010 ha participat activament, ha treballat en relació amb normativa contra el frau i la corrupció. Destacar també del seu currículum, no us avorriré gaire perquè estaríem tot el dia explicant l'enorme experiència del senyor Stephenson en l'àmbit que ens ocupa. Va ser delegat del Regne Unit al Greco i altres organismes internacionals amb el camp que ens ocupa i sobretot sí que voldria destacar que en els últims anys ha estat relacionat, és consultor independent i ha estat col·laborador de la Public Concern at Work també a una organització especialment dedicada a lluita contra el frau, contra la corrupció, protecció dels alertadors i, sobretot, soc jurista i no em puc estar, a destacar la col·laboració d'aquesta organització amb l'elaboració de la llei del Regne Unit sobre whistleblowing, que molts considerem una de les lleis models dins del marc comparat, un model a seguir en aquesta matèria. La seva ponència versarà sobre matèria jurídica i específicament normativa europea sobre protecció dels alertadors. Ja sense més preàmbul, perquè el que volem tots estem desitjant sentir el senyor Stephenson, doncs li dono la paraula a ell, agraint-li especialment en nom de l'oficina i de tots els assistents a l'acte que hagi tingut l'amabilitat d'acceptar la nostra invitació i que puguem comptar avui amb la seva ponència, amb la seva experiència i amb les seves paraules que segur que ens han d'encoratjar molt amb el camí que hem començat de treballar en aquest àmbit. Moltes gràcies, senyor Stephenson, i quan vostè vulgui. Bé, bon dia. Aquesta és l'única catalana que vull usar. I em sorry que és veritat que jo era, per la meva carrera, un servent civil, i per això... I'm not half as interesting as the speaker you just heard, um, but we have to have something to bring us back to Earth, I guess. Um, and I now do voluntary work since I retired from being a civil servant for public concern at work because they are a, a, a valuable asset. They provide, well, we come on and explain what they do later, but they basically are a charity that's not assisted by the government, and they've done a lot of good work on whistleblowing. Um, and I was asked to speak about uh, laws, and as we've heard this morning from uh, Signor Jimeno and uh, Madame Jolie, who gave an excellent, excellent presentation, um, laws are not everything by any means, uh, and awareness and culture uh, are more important. But all the same, laws can be the means to help promote cultural change. And and so they, they are worth doing, though we mustn't expect too much of them. And also, of course, we have to implement them, which is another problem. Um, ah. ah, sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to start by uh, what is whistleblowing. Um, and. Uh, the image in the English language comes from the, uh, the referee stopping the game with his whistle. And uh, he's asking, maybe these days he can go like this and you get a replay. But of course, it's something you shouldn't be doing all that much. You spoil the, the game in the case of football. And uh, it's also, we, we see, I saw a, a policeman in Albania with his whistle. He was using it all the time. Every three minutes, something happened in the street that he didn't like. I, I wondered if myself I was walking in the wrong place. It was impossible really to determine why he was blowing the whistle. And in the end, nobody listens to the policeman blowing his whistle because it means nothing. So that's, that's the image. And, uh, but the definition uh, which we have here is a worker, and I'll come on to why we talk about workers, a worker raising concerns about wrongdoing, risk, or malpractice with someone in authority, either internally or externally, with regulators, the media, or MPs. And in principle, we're talking about disclosure of wrongdoing that threatens other people, not a personal grievance. 
Uh, there's various legal reasons why countries should take action. Uh, we, as most of us uh, countries in Europe, have signed up to the Civil Law Convention of the Council of Europe, which has an article requiring the protection of whistleblowers. Um, that doesn't say anything about what that protection would look like. So more important is the recommendation that was made 2014 by the Council of Europe, which has been agreed by all the justice ministers in, of the member states. Um, so that is an important driver for the future. There's also the United Nations Convention Against Corruption that has a provision about whistleblowing, though it's, it's kind of voluntary. It says countries should think about it. Though my argument would be that any country that actually thinks about whistleblowing would surely have to do something about it because none of us have it right. Um, the United States is having a, a great effect on the private sector through their Sarbanes-Oxley Act which requires any uh, company that's registered on the US stock exchange to have a whistleblowing policy approved by their auditors. And so US companies and their subsidiaries or any other company that's registered on the US stock exchange is already having to do things. Um, then, of course, we all come under the, the Court of Human Rights and the freedom of expression principle has brought various cases to them this is the most important one uh, from Moldova. This was a case heard in 2008 by the Grand Chamber, and it set out the six principles for dealing with whistleblower cases. The first one is that the subject raised must be in the public interest, and they did make this very interesting remark here, or I've set out here, the interest which the public may have in particular information can sometimes be so strong as to override even a legally imposed duty of confidence. Uh, Mr. Guja was uh, working in the prosecutor's office and uh, he reported some exchanges there which were supposed to be confidential. But there we come to the second principle. There was the alternative channels which allegedly were open to him, were not convincing to the court. So therefore, it was justifiable for him to go directly to the press. It was such a strong uh, interest that you couldn't force him to use alternative channels that, that weren't any good. Um, the third principle, the information must be authentic not necessarily proved, but some justification for, for saying it's some belief in, in the information being true. The motives of the whistleblower, they say, should be taken into account, um, or rather they can affect the level of which, at which he's compensated. Um, the damage to the employer is another prin principle, how much damage was actually caused to the employer and the 6-1, what punishment was given to the whistleblower? Was it proportionate? Now, uh, though I was talking there about the legal reasons why you might do something about whistleblowing, but I, there's, that is not normally enough to affect any change. Um, so when we look at countries where something has happened, we normally find some uh, and some very big public concern about something or other. And in the UK, we were concerned, to, started off about fatal accidents. And the Herald of Free Enterprise was a, a boat which famously sank because it was set to sea with the doors open. Um, and workers had, of course, said they should not be setting off before they closed the doors. It seems so patently obvious that <laughs> you can hardly believe that it wasn't listened to, but of course they were saying, well, it's all right if it's if they close the doors before they get to the edge of the harbor, that will be all right. But of course, one day they didn't manage that. The ship sank. Many people were killed. Um, and sad to say, we still see that kind of thing going on. And you maybe have seen in the news recently the great fire in London of a tower block which was clad in inappropriate cladding that was combustible. So 
I, by passing a law on whistleblowing, we haven't uh, made it any more likely that people will listen. It's, that still seems to be a, an issue. But if we come to the kind of issue that concerns the anti-fraud office more, um, bribery, I think we had another case which went on for years in the Ministry of Defense, this man called Foxley, who for many years used to take 10% bribes on top of the contracts for defense procurement. And it was only after many years that he was discovered having uh, taken large amounts of money from foreign uh, governments. Um, or rather defense contractors, and he was sent to prison. Um, but the fact that he was so wealthy on a job where he, he shouldn't have been wealthy, it must have been totally apparent to his staff all these years that he had far more money than he could possibly earn. But nobody reported him, and I think they were scared to report him. And now I do think that that kind of thing is probably, no, <laughs> fingers crossed, I don't think that's going on anymore because I think people now, with the protections of whistleblowers, our whistleblower law, would report him. Uh, in Serbia, uh, they've recently passed a, a law, which I'll come on to, and in their case, it was a, there was corruption going on uh, on the roads. The people who operated the road tolls were uh, taking the money, a large proportion of it, for themselves. It was a thing called the road mafia. And a worker reported that, and he lost his job, and uh, it, the matter was dealt with, it was uncovered, but he was unemployed for several years, and so that led them on to uh, a certain public officials who actually wanted to do something about that and stop that happening again, and uh, so they did. Ireland is another story, and there it was political corruption about planning. Uh, bribes associated with uh, developments, um, planning developments. And it was backed up later with a big scandal in the Irish police, which I'll, I'll speak about later. Um, France, there's a number of cases which uh, Madame Jolie told us about some of them, and uh, perhaps the one that hit the headlines most, though, was this thing called the mediator scandal, which is a drug for weight loss which caused 2,000 deaths from heart problems, and the woman, the doctor who wrote a book about that, the drug company tried to suppress her book, but she won the case. Um, and then there's also evidence from research, I'll come to that. So we have research, and it is specifically about fraud, which does include corruption in this case, and international surveys that show us that whistleblowing is the biggest single reason why fraud is detected. And the figures we have, I've put up here, we have 33% uh, in the private sector. This is a large survey carried out by PricewaterhouseCoopers. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is what ACFE stands for, they showed 13, they found a figure of 39% in an average over both public and private sectors. And that average went up to 47% where there was a hotline where people could take their concerns to. That was a very big study again, 114 countries involved. And a study of the public sector only by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers found 49% um, of cases of fraud discovered were as a result of whistleblowing. And so you can kind of make sense of these figures, the variation in a way. You can find that the, it's, the public sector is more, has more uncovered by whistleblowers than the private sector. It may be because the private sector has better auditors, actually. And I know in some countries they actually just steal the, the best auditors from the public service. And that's how they get them. Um, I wanted just to look at this... Uh, case study of a whistleblower. This is a policeman in Ireland. Um, it shows, I think, how uh, you may discover something that, that doesn't look so important but turns out to be more important and even the cover-up itself is a problem, of course. So he, he used internal methods to report the improper use of the power that the police had in Ireland to quash penalties for driving offences and some other things where they weren't pursuing cases. 
And rather than them doing anything about it, they banned him from using the police computer by which he had found out these things. And when he, he didn't stop pursuing his arguments, and then they started making some allegations against him of sexual misbehavior, which were proved to be untrue later. They did eventually set up a kind of internal inquiry into what he was complaining about, and they said, well, some of these things are slightly irregular, but there isn't any corruption. He then went to the Public Accounts Committee, and they also spoke to the police commissioner, who said, and you can see this on the internet even, he said that the allegations were disgusting, and they shouldn't be speaking to the Public Accounts Committee, he should go internally. But he was undermined by a police inspectorate report, which showed that indeed there were uh, things going wrong with the uh, police power to quash driving penalties, and they were using it basically for off-duty policemen a lot of the time, and I presumably for other friends, and, that, and they would be saying, well, he's on, actually, he's on duty when he, he wasn't on duty, and things like this. And um, there was also a report by a barrister, Guerin, who uh, condemned the treatment of the whistleblower, and as a result of this report, the police commissioner resigned, though he said it was for family reasons, <coughs> And the Minister of Justice resigned as well, because the whole, the whole cover-up and the mistreatment of the whistleblower showed that things were really rotten, and we can really talk about corruption in, in the cover-up, even if we may not use corruption for this uh, original offence, original wrongdoing. Uh, the affair is still ongoing. I don't think we've got to the bottom of it yet, because uh, last year a protected disclosure was made by a policeman who uh, was a policeman who dealt with the press, he was a kind of press liaison officer, uh, that the police commissioner instructed him to brief the press maliciously against the whistleblower. Uh, uh, to turn now to the Council of Europe recommendation, it is the first detailed international measure and I think it should remain the benchmark for Europe and I'm not going to speak today about what the European Commission might or might not do but I think they could not do better than start with this as an expression of principles and as I say it's been agreed by the ministers of justice so hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to uh, gain acceptance for it. Um, it's applicable to threats or harms to the public interest these are the matters which can be reported. So they are, they are wide. And you might hope that somebody like Monsieur Del Tour would be covered by it. Um, it's to apply in the context of a work-based relationship. So this is going wider than saying the whistleblower would have to be an employee. But we're still looking at a work-based relationship with contractors or um, indeed volunteers or all kinds of people, people who are applying for a job or have left the job. So you could take this very widely under this definition. But I think it's right that whistleblowing laws uh, should particularly look at workers because workers are the ones who have the inside knowledge uh, they can, people in financial institutions, obviously are the best place to tell us what's going on in them. And they can understand the evidence and interpret it. And unlike the man in the street, they face the possibility of subtle retaliation from the employer, slightly disadvantaging them uh, in, in ways that might hamstring their work. And for example, with, with Sergeant McCabe, when they stop him looking at the police computer, <coughs> Um, and so they are the ones most in need of protection. The content of the recommendation is 29 principles. I think given all our different legal systems, it is quite hard to, to go beyond principles, but we'll see. Um, so the 29 principles, for example, talk about the whistleblower's right to confidentiality, 
subject to fair trial guarantees, which means there may be a point at which he has to say who he is or the, the, the uh, guilty person can't have a fair trial, the accused person, pardon me. And I think I should just say a word about uh, confidentiality, which is sometimes uh, confused with anonymity. Uh, anonymity is different in the, with an anonymous whistleblower, nobody knows who he is. The confidentiality route is, we think, a, a better one. That's to say his identity is known to a limited number of people who need to investigate it, and, um, but it's kept uh, hidden from everybody else. Um, there are problems for the anonymous whistleblower. He might be found out. And uh, he can also create problems for other people. And we have had cases in the UK where the wrong person is identified as the whistleblower. Everybody knows the whistleblower must be somebody from a small group. But because he's kept himself anonymous, they think it's somebody else. And that person gets victimized. And by an unfortunate loophole in the law, he is not protected because he never made any disclosure. He was not the whistleblower. So he can't be protected from the reaction. Um, but there is a, a, a hopeful way of combining the anonymity and the confidentiality, which is used by the German police, whereby the whistleblower can make a report uh, on, by email to a site which only he and the police have access to. He doesn't have to give his name at all. And he can have a dialogue through this means with the police and maybe they, in the end they'll build the confidence for the whistleblower to agree to reveal his name at least to the police. Um, another principle from the recommendation, protection is not lost if the whistleblower is wrong. Whistleblowers can make mistakes, of course. There's no mention of good faith Good faith has caused problems, at least in, in Britain, because it's m taken to mean uh, you, you could look at the motive of the person. Whereas, what does it really matter what his motive is as long as he's telling you the truth? Another important principle, number 25, the reverse burden of proof. It's very difficult for the whistleblower, if he suffers uh, some retaliation, to prove that the retaliation was caused by his whistleblowing. So by having a reverse burden of proof, we say that if something nasty happens to the whistleblower at work after he's blown the whistle, then the employer must demonstrate that it was for some other reason. The whistleblower doesn't have to demonstrate anything. The assumption is made that this bad thing happened to him because of the whistleblowing. Um, another important aspect is the availability of interim relief, which uh, Madame Jolie referred to. The whistleblower, if he is public, if he's gone public or if he's known, he may well not be able to work by, while the time this is, uh, his allegation is investigated. So we need to have a system by which he can be ordered uh, some continuing salary or funds to get him through this period. Um, this, rec this is only a recommendation of the Council of Europe and uh, I hope that in, in the end it will be overseen by Greco. Greco have done a good job in um, looking at other issues which were the subject of recommendations and one is political party funding which again was only a recommendation by the Council of Europe but Greco managed to push uh, a few uh, countries into doing things. Um, so the laws that we have in Europe so far, uh, we did kind of start off in the UK. Um, and since then, I'll talk about these all individually. Um, since then, we've seen these various laws, I'm taking Europe by the way, the Council of Europe area, 
Um, you could say that it's picking up a little bit now, and I'm not really aware of any other law that's uh, worth discussing at the moment. Um, the English law started with um, our common law. We have a principle, there is no confidence in iniquity. It's a rather nice principle, and uh, certainly a German whistleblower said he wished they had a similar thing in Germany. It means if you're doing something wrong, you can't expect anybody to keep that confidential. Um, another case held that you should disclose to the person who's got the interest to receive it, although you can, in some circumstances, go to the press. It can be justified. So our law was made, as I mentioned, following disastrous accidents, which weren't uh, prevented <coughs> when they could have been. And it built on that common law, which I've described. And uh, very importantly, it was, it was made by civil society, by public concern at work, in fact. It was not made by the government. The government only accepted it after an all-party consensus was built after five years of public debates and consultations. And the government insisted it must be cost-neutral, cost so it didn't really do all the things it might have done. But I think this process of building the law was, was very important to, for its acceptance. The features of it are, it has a, a tiered approach, so the internal route is more or less automatic. You can go to a regulator very easily as well. You just have to um, go to the right regulator, basically. And the press, you can go to, but this should be the last resort. Um, so it should be that you've tried the other routes and they didn't work, or it was, it could be so serious and so urgent that you couldn't go that way. Or it could be that those routes were disbarred to you in the first place because they, they weren't credible. And this is one of the things that should push governments towards creating credible routes for whistleblowers so that they don't all finish up in the press, but they can be resolved by regulators. It contains a reversal of the burden of proof on the lines discussed. Um, cases are heard by employment tribunals, which are, are not so burdensome to go to as the civil courts in our country. And I don't know if there is such a thing in, in Spain, but it, it certainly makes it a lot easier. Compensation is paid by the employer if the whistleblower has suffered detriment, which means any negative consequence at all. Uh, Public Concern at Work is a charity that provides free legal advice to whistleblowers. It's, um, the information it receives is subject to lawyer-client privilege. The whistleblower is alone. He often needs impartial advice on the best way forward, and going public is often not the best way for the whistleblower. Um, this is what happened in the first 10 years of the Act. The annual cases uh, going to the court grew from a low number, of, which is understandable, to 1,761. And we're kind of that level now. 70% um, were settled without a hearing. I, I don't think this is a bad result because uh, it means the whistleblower... Uh, had an outcome that was more or less satisfactory for them. Employers are anxious to settle. You do need the courts to, of course, take some decisions uh, in favor of whistleblowers, and that makes employers more anxious. But the result of the setting of the settling of so many cases is not surprisingly that 78% of cases taken to the court were lost by the whistleblower. which is a high number, but we hope that the 70% we the settled is, a, is an indication that it works in a number of cases. Um, the average known award, 113,000. The biggest award, 3.4 million pounds. Um, a weakness of the system is that out of 3,000 judgments, we only have information on what issue that whistleblower raised in 532 cases. That's because it's not automatic that this is made known. 
the focus is on the whistleblower and not on what he reported. So the five-year review, um, 2011-15, there's about 2,000 calls uh, to public concern at work a year, and the top three issues, financial malpractice, ethical issues, patient safety. Most of them raised their concern openly. About 70% who come to us have tried internal channels first. It's, it's a natural thing, I think, for whistleblowers to try internally first. Four out of five reported negative outcomes. But where they came early to get advice, there was more chance of a positive outcome. Uh, the latest advice line statistics, 2,530 uh, whistleblowers for advice, 86% from the public sector, which just uh, is interesting from the statistic we heard from the anti-fraud office, who uh, have a, only a small number of public sector uh, claims, whereas in fact, uh, experience in Britain shows that there's a lot. Um, but as you see, most of these, because we're talking about complaints over all kinds of issues, we're not normally talking about fraud. There's only 7% came from the financial services industry. Some of the other cases may have been fraud, but a lot of them are about uh, patient care and safety at work, things like that. As we see, 32% were from education and health. Uh, these are not normally fraud cases, though there could be some involved. Um, public Concern at Work set up a review of the Act 2013. It did find that the culture had changed, thanks to the Act. Um, there was a survey which suggested that more staff in the UK would report concerns than uh, in Europe generally. But uh, the act is not working because the whistleblower may be compensated, but the wrongdoing not addressed. Uh, the regulators need to know about the uh, claims. In general, the role of the regulators needs to be enhanced. If the regulator does his job, there's no need. There's not. There's no need for all the trouble we get with press. And so the idea is that there should be a new statutory code of practice which they and the courts will uh, ensure that employees f follow. And uh, actually I'd like to mention here the role of the uh, IATA, the International Air Travel Association. Everybody, every person who operates in international air travel, traffic control, they have to have a whistleblower system. International air traffic works pretty well. And it's because the regulator, the international regulator, is saying they must have whistleblower systems and they must report them to IATA as well. Otherwise, you can't actually be uh, registered by them. So this is the kind of measure that we would like to see uh, regulators adopt. They, they have a lot of powers to, and if they don't grant licenses uh, to companies who don't have whistleblowing systems, it could make a big difference. Um, the good faith requirement has gone, but it's retained for the, uh, it can affect the level of compensation, but it doesn't affect the right to compensation. Um, there were, we've had a concern about gagging orders being made despite the law. The law says you, you cannot uh, silence a uh, public interest disclosure, basically. But uh, sometimes in a settlement, you find employers say that the employee, they, they've given him some money, but he mustn't speak about it. So in a sense, they, they're trying to buy the silence. Um, so we want the, the recommendation is the law should be made quite clear. It, it actually says so anyway. It says that you cannot um, sell silence, basically. Uh, but it needs to be quite clearer that um, silence can't be for sold. Um, some, I'm conscious of the time, I'd better move on. Right, we have some issues unresolved in the UK and uh, in other countries too have these kind of problems. Um, the costs of taking cases to the tribunal. Um, we have a new test. Instead of good faith, we now have public interest, but we don't really know what that means. It remains to be seen what the courts make of it. Um, security services, it's a big problem internationally, of course. Uh, the our Whistleblower Act does not apply to them. 
We'd like to see a public interest defence for whistleblowers. Uh, we don't have anybody overseeing the system. Uh, uh, apart from the courts, we don't have an agency. So that's another thing to think about. Rewards is an issue we could talk about. We don't actually like them, but um, uh, it's worth thinking about. Um, and there is a problem with press payments for information. Uh, we, we have a press uh, that, uh, we have some aspects of our press who are undesirable and um, make payments for people to give them information about things which are of interest to the public but which are not in the public interest, like the movement of uh, celebrities through airports, for example. Uh, I'll just quickly go through these other um, things. Yeah, okay. Romania, they had a law. It was passed by an excellent Minister of Justice who immediately afterwards got the sack, so it was never properly implemented. Um, there wasn't a debate about it. It was done to get into the EU and then forgotten about, basically. Um, as we see, the various um, reports have shown that nothing much happened. Um, Slovenia has an interesting system which uh, may be of interest to the anti-fraud office because it's uh, overseen by the, um, the Corruption Prevention Commission. So it has to be about or related to corruption. They, don't, they can't consider the whole spectrum of whistleblower reports. And the whistleblower won't infringe any laws if he provides it, the classified information to them. Um, and they can help whistleblowers establish the causal link between the report and the retaliation. But the results, I have to say, haven't, don't seem to me to be very impressive. That when they asked for, asked for the latest figures, and they only provided protection measures in one case last year, and they also did take measures against a whistleblower for a malicious report. And it does seem to me unfortunate that the same body that helps whistleblowers will also punish the ones who make a malicious report. It must be discouraging, I think. Um, Ireland is a, is a good example. They, um, as I mentioned, there was a, a lot of corruption in the 90s. They had a a report 2012 which said that they needed to look at whistleblowing uh, which was too complex and opaque. They made the Act 2014. Um, it's an improvement on the uh, British law. Uh, it has a wider coverage including gross negligence and mismanagement. Uh, it has a right to sue third parties who retaliate. It's a defense in a prosecution uh, for any offense to sh for the whistleblower to show that the disclosure was protected. And uh, it has a special uh, appointee to take the very sensitive information which affects national security. And this person is a judge. He is called the disclosures recipient. And so your security service whistleblower has an independent person to go to uh, so he can have his concern addressed without going to the press. And I, I think we've... Otherwise, the danger is that if his only choice is to stay internal or go to the press, he may well go to the press, which is bad for him and bad for our security, I think. Um, first results in Ireland are quite encouraging, though Transparency International would like various changes in there. Um, uh, including a expanded list of regulators to go to and uh, obligations for regulators to act on the complaints received. Um, Serbia? Two minutes. Okay, very quick. The Serbian law is, is very good. I mentioned how it came about. Uh, uh, they had an extensive consultation 2012 to 14 over the law and uh, there was a big, big debate and they took a lot of international advice and it's a really good example. Um, that's some of the features of it. Oh, the court has to decide on interim relief within, within eight days of receiving the complaint. Employers who receive a whistleblower report must act on the report in 15 days. It's really tough stuff. Let's see if it works. We don't know yet. Netherlands, they have a long history of um, whistleblowing, uh, which uh, 
especially in 2012, they established the advice center called the Advice Point, Klockenleuder. Klockenleuder is a great word, a Dutch word. It means bell ringer. And this is like the whistleblower in Holland. It's like the idea of ringing the church bells. In Holland, they do it because there's a hole in the dam, maybe. But here, I know that there was church bells rung here. I was reading about it around the corner there. Um, some people from Catalonia rang the bells during the Napoleonic invasion to get the people out. It's the same idea. Um, what is interesting and unique about the Netherlands is they've now set up the House for Whistleblowers, an independent body which took in the advice function from the advice point and now has the power to investigate both the uh, abuse exposed and the employer's treatment of the whistleblower. Uh, the only sanction it can impose, though, is making its report public. So we need to see if that works. French law, we heard a bit about that. Um, I think it's a great development that France has uh, gone ahead with this loi Sapin, which Madame Jolly mentioned. Um, there's a lot of good features there, which I've mentioned. Um, Del Tour we heard about, so I, I won't speak about him. Um, international cases are obviously a problem and maybe a good reason for having a European directive. Uh, and yeah, as we see in the LuxLeaks case, one of the main things was the interest of the Luxembourg public might have been that they, they should have these tax deals made, but the interest of the wider European public was different. Um, Spain, I'd just like to, I mean, Spain has been criticized today. I'd just like to show there are some official bodies pushing for something. The, the report of the European Union semester says there hasn't been anything done on whistleblowers, so did the OECD, basically. Um, so looking at Spain, I just, these are some of the things I think needs to be considered. And to start with, as we've seen in other countries, we get a reaction when there's a fuss around some big cases. So you have some cases, so fine. Um, I think the Council of Europe is a good benchmark. France, I think France provides your, your best example as it's the country whose legal system is closest to you. Um, the scope as to whether you cover just corruption or all illegal acts uh, obviously needs to be thought about. I think most countries have gone for the all crimes approach, but we'll see. Um, I think I've mentioned all the other points here, really, except I should say specialised tribunal judges. I think that's important. We certainly regretted in UK we didn't have any requirement for specialisation of judges hearing these cases, and they have gone for that in uh, in Serbia. They even set it out in the war that in a law that the uh, the judges must who hear these cases must be trained. And um, I think that's probably the place I should stop. Thank you. Moltes gràcies, senyor Stephenson. Crec que la seva ponència ha estat interessantíssima. Crec que ens ha recordat alguns principis jurídics comuns amb el dret, però que està bé recordar-los i reflexionar. Ens ha fet reflexionar sobre confidencialitat versus anonimat, bona i mala fe. Li agraïm especialment també que ens ha parlat de les bondats dels sistemes, però també de les febleses que s'han posat en pràctica amb algun dels sistemes més avançats. I crec que això també ens ha d'ajudar molt a aprendre i i a treballar en aquest àmbit. Em diuen que tenim temps únicament, ho sento molt, per dues preguntes. Crec que n'hi hauria moltíssimes més, però com a mínim dues sí que en tindríem temps. Hola. Ja en tinc quatre, però bé, resum, faig un resum. Uh, so I, uh, I am from an activist group that we, uh, we do whistleblowing and uh, we are also publisher. We have the first uh, leaking box in, in Spain from the civil society. So my question are from uh, empirical reasons and problem that we have. Uh, several things. First, good faith. We have a problem with the trade seek directive because in the trade seek directive that have to be transposed in the state member, we have the request for the good faith, which we also think it's absurd, but how we can do with this transposition? Other question. Uh, we, uh, briefly, if you could tell the problem of reward, which, uh, because it's always very much in the debate, 
uh, which are the good uh, and bad aspects, for example, to have the reward system like in the US or in Germany, and why yes or why not the re reward uh, option for whistleblower. I'm not speaking about the press, but just uh, for uh, the whistleblowing. Uh, then we have a, a serious problem on the only worker aspect uh, of the legislation because, for example, in the case that we, have, we are treating in Spain, er, around 20% are not worker, like in our case, we, uh, we are uh, not the worker, but we are the whistleblower. So uh, if we cut out this part of the civil society, for us is a problem, and so why to focus only on the worker perspective. And the last is inversion of proofs. Uh, normally the law, the working legislation already cover the fact that if you are kicked out of your work, uh, the, 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 the employer have, have to prove he is doing right. But we have the uh, problem in inversion of proof when it's very small enterprise or, or company and is suggest to a calumny. Uh, so uh, I would like to have a bit more information about what you think, uh, how to use the inversion of proof uh, thing. Thank you. OK, well, I don't know if I can answer all those. But um, to start with good faith, I, since nobody really knows what that means, <laughs> I, I I don't think it, it's so much of a problem, and, and is it not possible just to say, well, good faith means you believe it's true, what you're reporting, and secondly, you're not taking money for it. Maybe we need to say that. But if you said those two things, couldn't you just say, well, that's good faith then, and, and have done with it? I mean, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about good faith. It's, we had the problem in the UK was we put it in the law and we thought it just meant you believe it, but the court said, oh, it means if he's malicious, then he hasn't got good faith. But it was a very arguable point, and we certainly argued that it just meant you believe it. Um, rewards, yeah, I mean, I've, I know that uh, in America you can actually become very rich by being a whistleblower. But it is a bit arbitrary the way it works, because uh, you, uh, you might be reporting something that hasn't got any money attached to it or you might be very lucky and there is a lot of money attached in your wrongdoing that you're reporting. Um, so it's kind of inherently unfair. Um, we don't support rewards in public concern at work because we think it, it damages the, ish, the, the image of the whistleblower who has maybe enough problems without um, being seen as somebody who's after money. Uh, it should, I think it's better to be seen as a public interest act. Um, the laws only apply to workers, which we can take very wide to mean all kinds of people in a work base in the context of the work relationship. We can take that wide. But I, I think if you get to ordinary citizens, then I, I mean, I don't know what protection the law's going to give them. The worker in the end can, can and should be compensated by his employer. Uh, the citizen, I don't know what's going to happen to him that the law doesn't cover in some other way. I think it would be up to him to pursue that. But okay, so we'll need to think about that more. Um, the burden of proof, well, I, I think we have, well we have a sort of answer to that in the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Uh, it, I think it works okay. that. Uh, The, the, the whistleblower hasn't got to demonstrate anything. The employer must demonstrate his reason for whatever happened to the whistleblower. Well, let's maybe speak at lunchtime more about that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Another, was there another question? Sí, bon dia. Sent? Sí, no? Vinc de l'Oficina de Transparència de les Bones Pràctiques de l'Ajuntament de Barcelona. I primer de tot agrair la, la, la ponència i, i uh, lligant una mica amb una de les experiències que ens ha dit el ponent, a mi m'agradaria donar a conèixer aquí eh, un, una eina molt similar a la proposta que s'ha fet a Alemanya eh, eh, d'un canal de comunicació específic eh, que permet tant la confidencialitat com l'anonimat 
a l'alertador per poder donar alerta de qualsevol tipus d'incidència de la que ara ens ocupa. És un exemple que també ha posat en marxa l'Ajuntament de Barcelona a través de la bústia ètica i de bon govern com una pota més del marc d'integritat que ha posat en marxa el govern de la ciutat. Penso que dona les dues opcions, dona l'opció de la confidencialitat i de l'anonimat i que és un exemple d'implementació d'una bona pràctica que a més a més no és només a nivell tecnològic, seguint l'ajut altruista que ens ha fet Xnet en aquest sentit, sinó que també té una cobertura normativa que permet assegurar que el govern ofereix una indemnitat al treballador que segueix aquesta via i una independència a qui ha de tractar aquests temes. Per tant, penso que és un bon exemple d'implementació amb tot. Si bé les lleis no ho són tot, sí que són necessàries i crec que la cobertura normativa amb una norma en rang de llei que protegeixi l'alertador amb un màxim nivell esdevé imprescindible. Si de cas hi ha mal debat, ho podríem anar aprofundint. Sí, si us sembla bé, aquesta seria per raons d'hora la darrera pregunta i podríem deixar la resta per la taula rodona, en acabar la taula rodona. Aquesta sí que poder, senyor Stephenson, si li sembla, però deixaríem la prospertera per més tard. That's okay. And, uh, well, I, I, I agree with the speaker. That's very helpful. Um, and I don't think I really need to answer that except to say I agree. Thank you very much. Cheers. Gracias, señor Stephenson.